It's me, Bobby Brown. Hey, what's up? I'm Kelly Rowland. Hi, this is Chelsea Clinton, and you're listening to me on That Total, Total Mom Lesson. And now a word from our sponsors. Hi, it's Kanika. Do you dream about being able to take your kids to the park on a random weekday and have a career that fuels your creativity? Yes, this is actually possible. And that's why I partnered with Amanda Rush Holmes, founder of Full Time VA, to sponsor this episode. What's the answer, you ask? Becoming a virtual assistant. As a virtual assistant, you can offer the services you want to offer, set your own rates, work the hours you want to work, and be your own boss. Now, you might be thinking, that sounds too good to be true. How do I get started? Amanda has put together a free training on how to become a virtual assistant that makes full-time income with part-time hours. And as a special gift for that Total Mom Sense listeners, when you go to thefulltimeva.com backslash mom sense, Amanda is also including a bonus free guide, the VA Kickstarter workbook. So visit thefulltimeva.com backslash mom sense for the free training and guide. Today, I am interviewing two luminaries pioneering the movement to create space for and celebrate those who identify as LGBTQ plus within our South Asian community, Aruna Rao and Shamina Singh. Aruna Rao is the proud parent of a transgender young adult and the founder of Desi Rainbow Parents and Allies, which serves diasporic LGBTQ plus South Asians and their families. She has served on the P Flag National Board and has two decades of experience as a mental health advocate and nonprofit executive. She has received several awards for her mental health work, including the 2011 South Asian Americans Leading Together Changemaker Award. Aruna, it is a pleasure to have you on That's Total Mom Sense today. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. So happy to be here. Let's go back to your childhood. Tell us a bit about it. I grew up in India in a very pan-Indian setting. My dad was essentially in public sector jobs and we traveled a lot. So I got a chance to travel all over India. We eventually settled settled in Bangalore, uh, which is where my family has roots and I grew up there. And it was it was a happy childhood. I was the youngest of three, very supported by my family, my parents, I had a good, safe, warm upbringing. What were some of the life lessons your parents imparted to you? You know, my dad was always like this big you know, inspiration for me. So one of the things is he came from nothing. He essentially like, you know, came from extreme poverty. And he built his life the way that he wanted to. And this was, of course, you know, pre-independent India was when he was born. And so his journey and his his willingness to acknowledge, you know, limitations, but also to strive beyond them, that kind of aspirational framework very much became mine. My dad treated all three of us. We were all girls. And as you know, there's a lot of like sort of pressure on Indian families to like sort of have this one male heir. And my dad never let us feel at any given time that women couldn't do what men could do. For his generation, he was a feminist and, you know, really believed in his daughters and essentially our career aspirations, what we wanted to do. So very much, you know, this lesson of being the change that you want to see was something that I absorbed. And from my mom, I think I got a lot of like humor and sort of aesthetics. You know, she was the one with the appreciation for like music and culture and dance and, and sort of joyful celebration. So those are all things that I think I feel I have absorbed from family. When did you realize that your purpose lies in advocating for mental health and even specifically to support the LGBTQ plus community? So the mental health piece came from the fact that I come from a family where there is mental illness. You know, I saw firsthand uh, what it's like to be a caregiver. And I think that really sort of really helped me enter my first career, which was really working as in mental health advocacy. Uh, where I started this program called Samaj, which was really about supporting South Asian folks in this country uh, who were caregivers for uh, people with serious mental illness. Essentially, it's a hugely stigmatized issue. We don't talk about mental health. In general, we don't like to talk about mental health, but particularly in immigrant communities, where there's a lot of like, uh, you know, uh, sort of pressure to be the model minority. We don't like to acknowledge or address these issues. The particular intersection of mental health and LGBTQ issues came when my child, who is now 25, 
first came out as queer in high school and then as transgender in college. As he keeps telling me and as we kind of like excavate our, our stories, we know that essentially the coming out really was like sort of lifelong for him. He made several attempts to like keep coming out, but it was something that my upbringing, as liberal as it was, didn't really allow space for. Like, I didn't really understand, you know, what that meant to um, to be LGBTQ. I was always, it's, it's someone else's problem. Good luck to them, but not my problem. So that was really how I had framed it. And so when I had to confront the fact that my beloved kid was queer and trans, I began to realize the extent of the whole, you know, set of like misapprehensions, the misinformation, the of, often harmful attitudes that I myself carried and that my community certainly carried. And um, looking for help essentially resulted in the fact that there's not a lot of help for immigrant moms who are kind of navigating this intersection of, you know, our racial and ethnic identity, our you know, upbringing perhaps in another country where there's been a lot of LGBTQ related um, homophobia and transphobia. That's how I entered the space, first as someone seeking support myself. And then as I went into, into LGBTQ spaces, which is what I started doing when I entered advocacy, I was just amazed by the level of outpouring of love and grief that LGBTQ folks greeted me with. I still remember my first few events where I went to where I was embraced. I was called auntie. People asked me, will you talk to my parents? You know, you're here as an accepting parent. Will you talk to my parent? So more than my own story, it was actually the need from the community that really drove me into advocacy in this space. Kind of break down that cross section for us. And when you went to these meetings, how many of these young people were South Asian? So many. So when I started off my advocacy, I actually started with PFLAG, which is the largest organization in this country, in the USA, for allyship and for you know creating like family acceptance. I was lucky enough to find initially an API PFLAG in New York City, where my mentor, who was a Korean mom of a trans kid, uh, really kind of led me into these spaces. And so I met a lot of Asian American, Pacific Islander people, including South Asian people. I was really supported in my journey in advocacy uh, by these groups, and there's many of them all over the country that specifically serve Asian American and South Asian populations. There were like national conferences where I was invited to speak as an accepting parent. And I was often the only South Asian parent, so all the South Asians gravitated towards me. How did you help overcome that stigma that it comes part and parcel with being South Asian and Certainly with the previous generation, I think you were fortunate that you had very open-minded, knowledgeable, liberal parents, but not everyone has that. How did you help that generation overcome it? I do actually want to point out that it's not necessarily generational. I think even first-gen folks in this country are carrying a lot of homophobia and transphobia. And sometimes actually, like I find it more in the diaspora community than in actually like back in India, which is, or, you know, South Asia, where things are progressing faster, perhaps because we're in a bit of a time warp with our values and our attitudes. So I don't want, do want to say it's not necessarily generational. I think the main thing that we really focus on with this rainbow work is really like getting people to acknowledge that their love for their kid or whoever it is in their life, you know, their sibling or their grandchild should lead, right? Because too often we have this look, kya kahenge, you know, perspective in the Desi community, which is pretty much, you know, what will people say? You know, what will people think of us? And there's this shame that's associated with, you know, having an LGBTQ identity or being a family member of someone who's LGBTQ. And so I think addressing the fact that the love is what needs to lead you, not the shame and not the apprehensions of what social pressures are going to be. So that said, I'm lucky enough to like know that I can discard, you know, relationships or friendships or community that will not support or accept or acknowledge my child. There are not so many people who are lucky enough to do that. And I think in those contexts, it's really supporting the parents or the family member in their own journey you know, they have to like address the layers of, of misinformation they've grown up with. Uh, for instance, you know, when my child first came out, my assumption was all the dreams and, hope, and hopes I had for my kid, you know, that what he was going to do with his life were all gone, merely because my child is now like part of a marginalized identity. 
And I think the journey for parents and families is very much realizing that the world uh, right now uh, will make space for LGBTQ folks and for their own lives. And it may not, may not be the same life, you know, the, the expectation that your kid will go to Harvard and kind of like, you know, get the, the, get the career that, they, that you want them to get, not necessarily that they want to get, and have marry and have 2.5 children and live in the suburbs. <laughs> that may not happen. Yeah. But that's not the point. The point is your child's well-being and happiness. And that brings me back to the whole mental health connection, right? Because there's a huge amount of data indicating that LGBTQ folks, particularly LGBTQ kids, are subject to a lot of mental health risks, primarily because of the social rejection that they experience. And of course, you know, in many places in the world, um, it's not just social rejection. It's essentially lack of legal protections of any sort and physical and emotional violence they're subjected to. Yeah, so I really think it's important that families kind of like come from a place of love and then start relearning. You have to like shed a lot of misconceptions and you know learn again on what the world could be. And um, it's actually a beautiful process. It, it makes you a much better person for it by the end. How did you conceptualize Desi Rainbow? Because at first you were a mother who came from you know this mental health space had a child who revealed that he wants to be transgender. And you said, I know I'm not alone. I'm going to create something so much bigger than us to help so many more people along the way. How, how did it come to be? I was just handing out my phone number and my email to everybody I met. And at some point, the volume of, of the need, essentially the intense need, began to exceed my own personal capacity. Right? I can't be there for everyone at every time. I began to realize that we needed some kind of framework, some kind of you know, structure. And you know, during my journey, I came across a lot of other accepting families who were willing to put their shoulder to the wheel. You know, they themselves were willing to like also do this work. And of course, a lot of LGBTQ people who offered their own support. So the idea was to build up a structure. And actually, I really feel like this is a calling because I feel that all the parts of my career and my journey till now have led me here because the mental health work was instrumental to understanding how this would work. So for instance, you know, peer support is one of the pieces in mental health recovery, which is really instrumental to people kind of getting to the other side of mental illness, right? Because without like a affirming loving community, you can have like access to therapy, you can have access to psychiatry, but it's very hard to get to the other side without an affirming community. So what I really like worked on was setting up a peer-to-peer -peer network, people, you know, across the country and now increasingly across the globe, because now that, you know, we're in a virtual space, it's a global community. Uh, people sort of like being trained to provide support to someone who's their peer, someone who's walked in their shoes. So for instance, we train parents to learn to have these conversations, to not, of course, you know, misrepresent themselves as anybody who's mental health, you know, licensed, but really to be a partner in this journey. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a program called Sathi. A Sathi in, you know, many South Asian languages means companion. And a Sathi really is someone who walks with you. And so we train LGBTQ folks, parents, family members to learn how to support someone else and be a companion in their journey. And so that's the infrastructure that, that I came up with based very much on my own training in mental health advocacy, you know, my own personal journey as a parent. So what is some of the tangible advice that parents get? Because I feel like a child knows themselves to their core at a very young age, more so than we can kind of realize. If they're feeling a certain way, that they can't articulate or communicate until they're older. And as you mentioned, your child had many phases, you know, where they felt, I, I want to share my coming out, but then, you know, how to actually process and then articulate that. With As a parent on the receiving end, how can we be so attuned and so open that we bring that out, that that hesitation or reservation or stalling doesn't occur. And give us some tips on, on how we can read into, you know, what our child truly feels. I think, you know, one of the main things is that we do refrain from giving advice because essentially that's the whole thing about peer support. We're not presenting ourselves as experts. We're presenting ourselves as fellow companions on the journey. But that said, uh, we certainly do share our own lived experience you know, how it is that we sort of, you know, and many times the stories that we share 
are of mistakes and errors that we sort of, you know, committed in the process. And so that's very helpful to people who feel like, you know, they can't really uphold this kind of high standard of being this loving, accepting, affirming parent right away. There is a grieving process for many parents when they realize that, as I said, the hopes and dreams they hold are, are no longer going to be perhaps valid in, in their assumptions of what their child's life will be. But I think the main uh, practical tips that we can give is you can't just wait for your child to come out to become an affirming person. You have to start the journey much before. In fact, I would say like, obviously pre-parenthood, you should really be an ally and you should be working on, for instance, like, you know, figuring out how can you support the LGBT community at large? How can you be an ally in practical, very like pragmatic terms? You know, how do you, for instance, make space for trans people in your community, in your workplace, you know, all these things. So if you take those initial steps to build yourself as a more affirming person, I think it's much easier, first of all, to read signs in your child. And the other thing that I really like appreciate when I see some like, you know, families who are really progressive, what they do is from birth, essentially, they allow their child the space to figure out who they are. I know of families, for instance, that will allow their child to use any pronouns they want and routinely address them as she, her, or they, them. So the child never feels like, you know, they're trapped in any one particular persona. Mm-hmm. You know, those are the kinds of things you can do. The other thing is really like what I've seen people do with their children, which is really helpful, is participate in allyship activities. You know, go to your town's pride parade or essentially volunteer at an LGBTQ center. You know, watch LGBTQ affirming shows on TV together. Sort of setting like a sort of environment of acceptance is really key because many children certainly pick up all the signs and signals in their home life, right? So you may think like a homophobic comment is no big deal because you're not really like serious about it as a joke. And so many people will pass these things off as jokes, but you're doing that as sending a signal to your child that this is not approved of. So I really think it's about you working on yourself before children, without children, as a parent on being an ally that will create a space for your child if and when they choose to come out to you. You've aligned with some celebrities who I feel are at the forefront of this way to be. I'm not going to call it a movement because it's how we are. To name a few, Lily Singh and France, Manish Goyal. Tell us how you all are kind of working together. Sure. Um, I just want to say like, you know, big shout out to all these folks, particularly uh, Manish Goyal and Shamina Singh, who are kind of like the, you know, dream this event up that's taking place tomorrow. It's really a celebration of LGBTQ DC folks and of the passing of the Respect for Marriage Act, which President Biden just signed um, in December of 22. And essentially it affirms the right for LGBTQ folks and for interracial couples to marry. It's a huge step and it's actually been codified into, into law now so that, you know, nobody can essentially challenge it. And Manish and Shamina dreamed up this as an opportunity to celebrate, but they also really wanted to partner with community-based grassroots organizations. So This Year in Bow is a small and mighty organization, which largely volunteer run. We have aspirations to serve a much larger group of people than we can currently, we currently have the capacity to serve. So uh, they really felt like, you know, this was an organization that could be supported. And I want to give a big shout out to Raymond Mathoda. She is our board chair, uh, Desi Rainbow's board chair. She is an out and proud lesbian, a Sikh. She has two sets of twins, so four kids. She and her family have embraced Desi Rainbow as their cause. She single-handedly in the past year has just kind of catapulted our organization into the next sphere. And so she's part of the uh, host committee. So really, really led us to this opportunity. And the opportunity really is to increase visibility of LGBTQ possibility models. I won't call them role models. You know, one of the things my kid always tells me is that when he was looking around his suburban New Jersey town, he never saw anybody else who was queer, brown, trans, immigrant. You know, there were no possibilities for him. So what these folks, you know, Manish, Shamina, you know, Tan France, Lily Singh, Cal Penn, Gray, um, what they're doing is providing possibilities for this next generation of LGBTQ kids. You know, so you don't have to like, just like assume that it's fantasy, that your life can be fulfilling, can be lived authentically. 
you can actually see it right in front of you. So I think that inspirational uh, aspect is what we're really doing with this event. And of course, you know, having a wonderful party. And I'm also really appreciative that this event and all the you know famous names associated with it have enabled the Rainbow to do a lot of fundraising to build our capacity to serve our community. And it is really a group effort. I'm looking forward to seeing you at the event and I'm very much an ally in all that you're doing. Tell us about a mom sense moment that you had. Just one story for us. When my kid first came out as queer, it was really sort of a shock to the system for me. You know, I didn't really like, I didn't know what to do or what to say or how to affirm. As I began to like engage more in advocacy, as I mentioned, you know, going to LGBTQ events, meeting other LGBTQ folks, I began to meet a lot more transgender people. And again, this was completely foreign to me that, that you know, people actually had diversity in gender identity. And when I noticed that my kid in college was beginning to dress differently, was beginning to, you know, they cut the hair very short, the posture changed, things like that. And again, you know, when a kid is in college, you're not like breathing down their neck all the time. So you can't really like see what's happening. But I was like, okay, so this is something I have to like really address it. So I basically just asked, I just said, you know, do you feel that you might be transgender? Initially, he didn't want to talk to me about it. He wanted to kind of like, you know, he was really exploring by himself, you know, what his, what his life was going to look like. But eventually he's told me, yes, he said, I, I am transgender. And that's when we led to the conversation about, you know, transitioning and what that would look like for him. So I really felt like, you know, my being, my noticing something and essentially addressing it directly was a big step in our relationship. Uh, is there a quote that you live by? Well, this is a kind of like, you know, it, it's an old chestnut, but uh, be the change you wish to see, see is really like my favorite. And I think I've lived my life by that. Excellent. And where can my listeners find you and Desi Rainbow and be a part of this cause? Uh, our website is desirainbow.org. And uh, you can feel free to like browse and, and look at all our programs. We have a whole range of public facing programs. Proud Possibilities is one where we interview LGBTQ possibility models, even allies. And those are like kind of publicly posted on our YouTube channels. They're open Zoom events that anybody can join. And of course, we're on social media. So you can find us at the Rainbow Parents on, on social media. Thank you so much, Aruna. I look forward to meeting you soon. And I really appreciate you sharing your story with all of us today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. For more than 20 years, Shamina Singh has been on the front line of developing and implementing solutions to make the global economy work for everyone, everywhere. Shamina is the founder and president of the Center for Inclusive Growth, the social impact hub of MasterCard. She also serves as executive vice president of sustainability and is a member of the company's management committee. Currently, she sits on the boards of ADL, a global anti-hate organization, and the Ann Richards School for Young Women Leaders in Austin, Texas. Deeply committed to public service, Shamina has held senior positions in the White House and the U.S. House of Representatives. In 2015, she was appointed by President Obama and confirmed by the U.S. Senate to a six-year term on the board of AmeriCorps, a $1 billion independent agency that places over 270,000 volunteers with social sector organizations across the U.S. She served as chair for two years. Shamina is a lifelong learner who has studied at Harvard, Yale, Stanford, and the Indian School of Business. Shamina, welcome to That's Total Mom Sense. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So let's take it back. Give us some highlights of your childhood, because I think that always sets the stage for who you are today. Well, I'm the first born Indian American daughter of my parents. We had three sisters born in India, and then two girls were born in the United States. I was the first of those two. Uh, grew up in a smallish southern city um, in southern Virginia in the Hampton Roads area. And when my family moved there, we were one of, I think, the first Indian families there. 
and certainly one of the very first Sikh American families. And so my father came to Virginia to teach at a local community college where he had he got the placement and uh, was wearing his his turban and beard at the time. So very interesting, unique entree into the world, but uh, very much enjoyed my time there and enjoyed growing up there. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm Punjabi American myself, and I feel like that story resonates with me. So what was it like growing up with five daughters in the house? <laughs> Really fun, really exciting, you know, uh, you know, technically of number four of five. So having three older sisters who really paved the way and I guess in some respects broke enough of the rules so that by the time I was coming through, my parents were tired of fighting and being as strict as they were with the first three. My parents had this tradition of breakfast table conversations, dinner table conversations where they would invite very interesting people over you know, from the, cause we lived in a, in a town that had access to, you know, universities and things like that. So my parents would just invite people over who they would meet. And we had the benefit of learning from all of these outside influences, but it also, we we're also forced to have a point of view and then be able to defend that point of view. And so we spent many a breakfast table conversation arguing over democracy or arguing over who was president or arguing about whether boys are better than girls or girls are better than boys or, you know, academics over extracurricular activities, music over science. So sort of anything you can think about, our parents were very interested in ensuring that we could articulate a point of view, develop a point of view, and then sort of defend a point of view. And so we spent a lot of time and energy um, really honing in on different kinds of perspectives, but very an intellectually stimulating environment to be sure. Wow, absolutely. Um, And I think that because your family was so adroit at having all of you share your opinions and perspectives, that allowed you to create space. And um, Oprah says this, if there's no seat at the table, you pull up a folding chair. (laughs) (laughs) And you've, you've done that. And to see the heights that you've taken your career you know, I, I said this in my intro, you are the founder and president of the Center for Inclusive Growth at MasterCard. You're also the executive VP of sustainability and a member on the company's management committee. Prior to that, have worked with the Obama administration, AmeriCorps. It's it's amazing how you found places that needed your work and advocacy and made a change. Yeah, I wish it was as linear as that, although it It sounds even impressive to me, but I think that the, you know, just to build on the Oprah comment, I had a very strong mentor slash sponsor in Governor Ann Richards, who was the the former governor of Texas, and I actually moved from Virginia to Texas to work on her political campaign. And she had a saying that said, if you don't have a seat at the table, um, you're likely on the menu. So I think Oprah and Governor Richards certainly had it right. But I think the way that you know, I was able to get a seat at that table was really through the mentorship, sponsorship, influence of incredible people who took not only a chance, I think, on my leadership, but were actively involved in developing me as a leader, as a citizen, as a contributor. But again, all that that really got started, I think, um, you know, around that that dinner table, that breakfast table with my family. Yes, yes, we can definitely trace it back to that. And then tell us about the LGBTQ plus community and why it's, you know, just this this space that you're so passionate about and, and you're advocating for. For me, I mean, personally, obviously, I've been on a personal journey around my own development as in, you know, as or incorporating the LGBTQ part of myself into my own personal journey and have been married to the same person for, I don't even know, I think it's 15 years, but we've been together for almost 20. And, you know, it's, you know, in, in the South Asian community, and I'm sure in many other communities, marriage is such an important part of your identity as, uh, you know, in the family and children and sort of things like that. And so for my family, even as progressive as they were, 
you know, being a gay professional leader was interesting and they were accepting. But when I got married, it changed the conversation with my extended family in India. It was a way that they could relate to me in a way that they couldn't before because they understand marriage and they understand commitment and they understand family. That's why it's been so important to be part of the journey for our entire, you know, the LBGT community at large to recognize that, look, marriage may not be for everybody, but recognizing that the Respect for Marriage Act was passed by bipartisan Congress and signed by President Biden is a momentous part of our history. And so I think at, you know, from the highest of mountains and the theoretical sense, from a rights perspective, it's very important, but very personally, all the way down to, you know, me and my family and my community and things like that. It's a very personal recognition and validation that love is love. Then, you know, in, you know, Hindi PR is PR, like, you know, it's, we're all one family, but I think that that's part of the reason why I have been somebody who I think has been vocal and wanted to support and then wanted to recognize with the event with Manish, who owns Sona, that we're two older professionals who have sort of been, you know, had some success in our lives, who happen to be married to people that, you know, we love. He has a has a child, but that we should bring that visibility and bring that recognition of marriage to a wider community, which is another reason why I'm so appreciative that you're featuring this on on your podcast. And I want to bring it back to those who are in India, because there was this very landmark court ruling that legalized gay sex. It's called Section 377. First of all, the fact that the government has any place in a ruling like that is, um, you know, mind boggling. But when do you think India is going to follow suit and have a ruling for you know, a same-sex marriage act? I don't know. I think it's an important conversation that they're having. I think that, you know, it's an important moment in in time. You know, India is the, we, we call India the largest democracy. And, you know, we have all of us, you know, I have strong roots there and I have friends who are part of the the conversation and and what's happening there. And so I can only hope that it's a fruitful discussion and that they get to the place where, they're going to go sooner rather than later. But I think that all of these conversations, not only in the United States, but everywhere are evolving. And even, and I'll just sort of say this as well, it's that it's an important milestone, but it's not the end of the conversation. Like all of these things take time, but they're also things that we have to keep our focus on every day. As much as the Respect for Marriage Act in the United States has come to pass, I think it's come because there's a concern with so many other rights in the United States right now that we wanted to make sure that this was solidified, that marriage was recognized and solidified because we do see the fragmentation and the erosion of rights on so many other issues in the United States for Americans. And so I do think that it's important to keep our focus, again, not to hold America or the United States up in some way that is holding India back or any other country, but just to sort of say, these are all things that matter to all people. And we need to make sure that we're having the widest view possible of inclusion for all people. You're aligned with many celebrities with this event um, that's culminating. And, you know, to mention some names, Lily, Lily Singh, Tan France, Manish Goyal, they're all working um, in tandem with you to make sure that all of this is celebrated. It's just fantastic because, again, I think it shows the evolution of our community in the space and the fact that there are people from the entertainment industry, from the financial services industry, from the tech industry, from nonprofit organizations that are all going to be present and all very well represented um, and is a testament to, you know, where we've come as a community and the fact that we can gather and we can attract funding and sponsorship from organizations like the Asian American Foundation, from MasterCard, from Deutsche Bank, from McKinsey, from JP Morgan. You know, that to me is also a it's not a validation, but a recognition that, you know, this is an issue and this is a community where people want to be and companies want to be more involved. And the fact that we have entertainment and finance and tech and all the other sort of coming together in this moment to support 
and acknowledge the Respect for Marriage Act um, and the continuing you know, pursuit of uh, LGBTQ rights for everyone everywhere in support of they see rainbow, I think is a it just it speaks volumes about the support, but also the people who are being supported. But most importantly, the issue that we need to support. And how can we get involved from, you know, those who live in thriving metros like New York and then those who grew up in a small town in Virginia like you did? How how do all of us get involved? The reason why we are partnering with They See Rainbow Alliance is because that is a network of, you know, family support around the United States that folks can tap tap into for support. So I would encourage people to take a moment to go to their website and to contribute, but also to take part in the, the service offering that they have, but to also use that if they're able as a gateway to other things that they may need. I mean, there's so many good organizations that they see Rainbow apart, like Salga, like, you know, HRC, like PFLAG, like Trevor Project, There's so many support organizations out there that I hope that people will take advantage of to help their families who may be wrestling with issues or going through a journey to seek solace and support, you know, with people going um, through the same journey. And if you're not, if you're fortunate enough or if you're in a place where you can contribute, then I hope that you'll consider contributing to one of these great organizations. Tell us about the inner knowing that you had and how you kind of revealed that to your family. Let's call this the Mossy sense, since uh, I'm the, (laughs) since I have nieces and nephews and I'm known as Shamina Mossy, but um, well, I just, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the parents in my life, the parents that um, my sisters have become through their knowing, uh, my knowing is just so much richer. And I'm so grateful every day that, they are raising good citizens, you know, and good individuals. And I see every day just how hard it is for the kids and the parents to, you know, especially post COVID, like how to navigate all of the the things. And so I'm constantly amazed and constantly grateful that they have embarked on this journey because the, the richness of the children that they're raising is just incredible. So I get the glory of being a Masi who can, you know, support and be a part of it, but not necessarily have to do the incredible work <laughs> that they're doing. So I like to say that, you know, my wife and I are, you know, really incredible aunties that, you know, support, uh, support the kids. But I think my inner knowing is that this is a very tough time, I think, for families and for children and for people who are trying to navigate all of the things that come with adulthood. If there is one thing that can come out of, you know, this event or this this legislation or, you know, this podcast, I hope it is that adults, children, parents, families remember and always recognize that they're not alone. And that even though I may not have children of my own, I recognize that we all have responsibility and ownership for all children. And that's something that I have learned from my parents and from my sisters. And so I hope that if there's one lesson that comes out of this, that people remember that you're not alone and that your inner knowing is valuable and welcome to all of us. And Masi is Ma Jesse. So you're making that impact in your own way, which is really, really amazing. What is a quote that you live by? I'll give you a quote from my sister, Simi, who always says, when in doubt, do the next right thing. That's really, really wonderful. And where can my audience find you and support you? Well, if they want to learn more about the work at the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, then I would encourage them to go to a mastercardcenter.org where we are working every day to ensure that the benefits of all economies are grown equitably and sustainably around the world. So visit mastercardcenter.org to learn more about the work that we're doing around inclusive and equitable growth for everyone. Thank you so much, Shamina. It was a joy to have you on. I really appreciate your insights and I'm excited to celebrate with you this week. Me too. Thank you again, Kanika. Thanks for listening to this episode of That's Total Mom Sense. Aruna and Shamina, You two are wonderful, and I really, really appreciate you sharing your story. 
A big thank you to A-Game PR, specifically Anita, Alpana, and Carmina for making this happen. I had such a wonderful time at the event at Sona, where we all celebrated President Biden's Equality for Marriage Act. Manish Goyal was the perfect host, and it was wonderful to see Cal Penn, Prabhul Gurung, Sheetal Sait, and so many other entertainment and fashion dignitaries celebrating this milestone ruling. As always, subscribe to That Total Mom Sense on Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And be sure to rate and review the show when you can. It helps a ton with algorithms, and I love reading your messages. You can follow me at Kanika Chada Gupta on Instagram, where I post the latest on my guests and the topics I'm covering. And you can write to me at that's total mom sense at gmail.com. I love hearing from you. And now a word from our sponsors. Hi again, it's Kanika. Before we wrap up, have you tirelessly been Googling the best work from home jobs? Are you looking for the type of job that allows you to show up in the most important parts of your life yet still bring home a paycheck? Or are you looking for a side hustle that fits into your already packed schedule? You might even have exhausted a search or 10 on Google, Instagram, and random mom groups trying to find a work from home job, one that pays well, offers flexibility, and won't bore you out of your mind. As a mom of three, it's important to me to be present and spend time with my kids after school while having a thriving career in podcasting during the hours that work for me. And that's why I partnered with Amanda Rush Holmes, founder of Full-Time VA, to sponsor this episode, because she gets it. As parents, we can't be in two places at once, and work-life balance is a misnomer. A career as a virtual assistant allows you to set hours that work for you, so you have time for your family and you each week. Being a virtual assistant comes with amazing perks like offering the services you want to offer, setting your own rates, working the hours you want to work, and being your own boss. This is how you can be present for your family and have a fulfilling career, bringing in income on your own terms. No more wishing, hoping, and Googling. Now you might be thinking, this sounds good, but how do I actually get started as a virtual assistant? Amanda has put together a free training on how to be a virtual assistant that makes full-time income with part-time hours. There are actually two versions of this training. So whether you're looking to ditch your nine to five or start a side hustle, there is a customized training for you. And as a special gift for that Total Mom Sense podcast listeners, when you visit the full-time VA, dot com backslash mom sense. Amanda is also including a bonus free guide, the VA Kickstarter workbook. So visit the fulltime va.com backslash mom sense to grab your free training and guide. Now back to the interview. Remember, always trust your mom sense and dad sense. Stay strong, super parents. I'll see you next time.